In this video, we're going to talk about antibody-mediated uh, transplant rejection. The recipient or the host is the person who receives the donor organ. The recipient can receive a renal transplant, a pancreatic transplant, and a liver transplant. The donor organ has its own unique antigen that is different to the recipients. They can be labeled as foreign antigens. When a recipient receives a donor organ, the recipient or the host's immune system will try and defend itself by mounting an immune response. This immune response towards the donor organ is what leads to rejection and the transplanted organ uh, dysfunction. There are two main types of transplant rejection, T-cell mediated and antibody mediated rejection. The T-cell mediated transplant rejection can be divided into acute or chronic rejection. Antibody mediated transplant rejection is divided into hyperacute, acute, and chronic. In order to reduce and prevent uh, an organ rejection, patients who receive an organ transplant take immunosuppressive agents to suppress their immune system. In this video, we will focus on antibody mediated rejection and try to understand the pathophysiology and treatment. Each and every individual has a unique tag or code. This donor tissue or organ contains unique human leukocyte antigen, HLA, as well as any other antigen. When it comes in contact with the host's immune system, the host's antigen-presenting cells will recognize the tissue as foreign. It engulfs the tissue and their antigen and presents the foreign antigen to the host's CD4 T cells, also known as the T helper cells. The antigen-presenting cell activates the T helper cells, which in turn will activate B cells to become plasma cells. Alternatively, the B cells and the T helper cells can uh, co-stimulate, activating each other. Activated plasma cells will then produce antibodies towards the foreign HLA molecule or other foreign antigen parts. The antibodies bind to the donor cells and trigger a number of downstream events that ultimately lead to the immune system attacking the donor tissue. This is termed antibody-mediated rejection. One of the first things that happen is that the antibodies can bind to foreign HLA and activate the complement system, a series of proteins that, when activated, triggers cascade of complement protein activation. One of the activated proteins is C3A, which stimulates monocytes, macrophages, and neutrophils. This is the same for C5A, which is a split product uh, caused by C5 convertase. C5B, the other product, help form the membrane attack complex, or MAC for short, composed of C5 to C9 complement proteins. The membrane attack complex causes cell lysis and ultimately cell injury. The injured donor cells will release chemicals that will activate surrounding endothelial cells to express adhesion molecules and release cytokines and chemokines to help attract other inflammatory immune cells to the area, such as neutrophils and macrophages. These activated immune cells further release cytokines, which recruit other immune cells, including natural killer cells, which will attack the donor cells. Endothelial cell injury at activation leads to hemostasis, where you have platelet activation and thrombosis. Thrombosis, if uncontrolled, may lead to ischemia of the tissue due to occlusion in the blood vessel. You can see visually that antibody-mediated rejection of a transplanted organ is complicated. The initial interaction between the host's antigen-presenting cell and the host's T helper cell is the indirect pathway. The direct pathway is when the donor's antigen-presenting cell, which is now present in the recipient's body, 
presents the foreign uh, antigen directly to the host's T cell. Antibody mediated rejection can be divided into hyperacute, acute, and chronic. So, what are the differences? Well, hyperacute rejection occurs due to preformed donor specific antibodies present in high amounts before transplantation even occurs. Donor specific antibodies are formed if a person has had a prior transplant, blood transfusion, or because of transmission from the mum. Hyperacute rejection presents as graft rejection within minutes to hours after transplantation. Now it's rare, thanks to better HLA matching and ABO compatibility. Acute rejection usually occurs when the immunosuppressive agent someone is taking is reduced. The immunosuppressive agent is unable to withhold or stop the host's immune system from attacking it, and as a result, acute rejection occurs. Acute rejection can occur at any time during the transplant period, and can be days to weeks. To prevent acute rejection, careful immunosuppression tapering and dose adjustment is required. Chronic rejection is usually due to non-adherence to immunosuppression or difficulty in increasing the immunosuppressive agent for whatever reason. As a result, the host slowly develops low titers of donor-specific antibodies over time, which causes rejection and failure of the solid organ. An important investigation to distinguish antibody-mediated rejection to cell-mediated rejection is by measuring the complement protein which work alongside the antibodies, specifically complement protein 4D, which is a marker of antibody-mediated rejection. Once antibody-mediated rejection is established, what are the treatment options available? Well, the treatment is immunosuppression because you want to dampen the immune system. The choice of immunosuppressive agents will depend on the organ affected and also whether there is an acute or chronic rejection. In general, multiple immunosuppressive agents are used, and they can include the following. Firstly, increasing glucocorticoids, which work by inhibiting the immune cell function on multiple levels. But these come with many side effects, which I will not discuss, but include diabetes and osteoporosis. Plasmapheresis removes plasma from the blood, which contains the donor-specific antibodies. The removed plasma is then replaced with a substitute. Intravenous immunoglobulins is essentially pooled antibodies given to a patient. The ultimate goal of this therapy or the mechanism is broad, but it is to normalize a immune system, essentially. The side effects of intravenous immunoglobulins include arthralgia, myalgias, and hypertension. Eculizumab is a monoclonal antibody directed against the C5 fragment of the complement cascade and inhibits the generation of the membrane attack complex we have learned. The side effect is that mainly it increases the risk of Neisseria meningitidis infections. Let's look at a zoomed view of the interaction between the T helper cell and the B cell. The T helper cells activate the B cells to mature to become plasma cells. It does this by binding to receptors and releasing cytokines. Belatacept specifically binds to B7 receptors, specifically the CD80, CD86 subtypes that are found on the antigen-presenting cells, such as the B cells. Belatacept prevents co-stimulation between T and B cells. The side effect of belatacept is that it increases risk of uh, cytomegalovirus, Epstein-Barr virus, and post-transplant lymphoproliferative diseases. Alemtuzumab is a humanized monoclonal antibody against CD52 on lymphocytes. This then mediates lymphocyte destruction through a number of mechanisms. The side effect of alemtuzumab 
is the autoimmune phenomenon. It increases the risks of things such as ITP, Graves' disease, and anti-GBM. Rituximab is an anti-CD20 monoclonal antibody. It depletes B lymphocytes that expresses CD20 on their surface. The side effects are many, but the main one is that it increases the risk of progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy. Tocilizumab is an antibody against the interleukin-6 receptor. Interleukin-6 is an important inflammatory cytokine. Inhibiting interleukin-6 uh, receptor means interleukin-6 cannot trigger inflammation. The side effects of tocilizumab include hypertension and hyperlipidemia. Cyclophosphamide is an alkylating agent and inhibits the cell cycle. It reduces B and T cell, basically, development. Side effects include hemorrhagic cystitis and gonadal failure. In summary, the immunosuppressive agents used to treat antibody-mediated rejection, or any rejection for that matter, comes with many side effects. This includes, one, it increases the risk of infection because you're suppressing the immune system. It increases the risk of reactivation of basically dormant infection or latent infections. It increases the risk of malignancy. There's obviously a risk for transfusion reactions as well as allergy. In summary, chronic rejection develops slowly with antibodies produced in low titers. Chronic rejection is likely due to poor compliance or issues with taking immunosuppressive agents. Along the way, the host may develop acute rejections, and this can be uh, due to a reduction in their current immunosuppressive dose. In this scenario, the logical thing to do is to increase their immunosuppressive uh, agent again. It's about finding the right dose of immunosuppression, making sure the transplant organ is functioning well, and, man and managing the complication of the immunosuppressive agents. Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video.